why don't we go ahead and get started here. I'd like to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Jim Hurley. He hails from the University of Washington. He's had an interesting career. He started out in environmental sciences and forestry. He studied plant metabolism. Um, he earned his PhD from the University of Illinois in biophysics and physiology. He did three postdocs in California, one right after another. And now he is professor of biochemistry and adjunct professor of ophthalmology in, um, <coughs> uh, at University of Washington. So Jim has been interested in answering fundamental questions uh, in neuron phototransduction. He has, over the years, identified and characterized a number of different genes that are critical for vision. And more recently, he's been interested in um, photoreceptor and RPE energy metabolism, and that's what he's going to talk about today. So we know that photo, uh, photoreceptors are incredibly energy consuming cells. And one of the most fundamental questions is how do they wrestle energy away from the RPE? Uh, how do they harmonize to efficiently get enough energy to enable vision? So um, without much further ado, his title is The Importance of Nutrient Supply and Energy Metabolism in the Retina and RPE. <clears throat> thanks, Lawrence, and thanks for the invitation to uh, uh, to speak with you guys and, and meet and meet with you guys. Um, so, uh, I, what I'm going to try to do uh, this morning is just sort of uh, bring you guys uh, up to date on uh, our current thinking about uh, energy metabolism in the retina and the pigment epithelium. And so, uh, the bottom line is going to be that the, uh, as Laura was saying. That the um, uh, most of a lot of nutrients come from the uh, choroidal blood flow, and to get to the photoreceptors uh, in the retina, they have to go through in the rest of the retina. They have to go through the uh, uh, the pigment epithelium. So, uh, what we're what we've been sort of realizing over the uh, past several years is that these uh, the energy metabolism in these cells is uh, is actually very uh, is very specialized. So that each cell has a, a sort of specific function in this uh, ecosystem, if you will, and that if uh, if any one of those energy metabolism uh, energy metabolism in those cells fails, then the whole the whole ecosystem could could fail. So that's sort of the the bottom line of what, what I'm going to tell you about. And um, and I'm I'm a, not a clinician, uh, but uh, since this is a, a, a basic uh, a, a grand rounds, um, I, uh, I I thought I'd, I'd start with a few uh, uh, case uh, case studies. Um, and uh, so these are uh, so. What I'm going to tell you about uh, next is uh, several different uh, lines of mice that people have made uh, over the years, um, that uh, over the past 10 years or so, that, have, that gave sort of puzzling results. And so I'll go through those, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what our model is for this uh, retinal ecosystem and how, uh, from that perspective, uh, those results make a little bit more sense. So uh, the first... Um, so each of these each of these mouse models uh, uh, had had a you know they they uh, the investigators made a, a specific a specific defect a genetic defect in the mice, and so in this one uh, the mitochondria in the pigment epithelium cells were disabled, but the um, surprising finding was uh, that the photoreceptors suffered as a result of that, and in this mouse um, uh, another group um, enhanced glycolysis. In the pigment epithelium cells, and I'll, re I'll review uh, a little bit about energy metabolism in a few minutes. But in, in the first case, they disabled the mitochondria. In the second case, they uh, enhanced glycolysis, so they used more glucose. Uh, but it, it, as a result of that, the photoreceptors degenerated. And then in the third uh, example, I'm going to show you um, uh, the rods degenerate because they had a mutation. Uh, there was a mutation in a rod-specific phototransduction gene caused cyclogenep to accumulate, causes the cells to uh, to degenerate. But in that case, uh, there was uh, 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 the uh, glucose uh, didn't actually make couldn't actually make it through the pigment epithelium. It got stuck in the uh, in the pigment epithelium. And then in, in another uh, model, um, the rods degenerated also because of a rod specific gene. Uh, uh, but in that case, even though the, the defect was in the rods, uh, it's the cones that actually uh, are suffering because uh, the, the cones are starving; they're not getting nutrients. Um, 
And then uh, in the final example, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's um, a retina where there are fewer than normal uh, number of photoreceptors. And so, uh, so, but the photoreceptors that are there, uh, even though they're perfectly genetically normal, uh, they, they don't grow properly. They don't get, it, it seems like they don't get enough, uh, don't give enough nutrients. So let me go through uh, some of these examples. Um, so this one uh, is a mouse that was uh, made in Doug Volrath's lab at uh, Stanford. And uh, what they did was they, uh, they knocked out, they inactivated the gene for uh, TFAM, which is a, a mitochondria uh, specific, uh, tra it's a transcription factor that's required for, uh, for mitochondria. And so as a result, the, uh, uh, the mitochondria uh, were dysfunctional. They, didn't, uh, they were small and, and barely there. Uh, in the pigment epithelium. But uh, what you can see is, uh, so as a result of that, the pigment epithelium was, was abnormal uh, and, the, uh, and it, it de-differentiated somewhat. But uh, the, the really striking finally, finding was that the, the photoreceptors uh, were stunted. They, they didn't have uh, their full outer segments and they, uh, and they degenerated. But remember the defect, not in the photoreceptors, the defect was in the, uh, was in the pigment epithelium cells, okay? So that's one example. Um, this just shows the, I think this, these are the uh, ERG responses uh, and uh, uh, in the uh, um, normal and in the, uh, uh, the mutant ones. Uh, so these are coming from the photoreceptors again, even though the defect was in the thing that they're doing. Okay, and then uh, another example, this is made in uh, Marty Friedlander's lab. Um, and uh, in this case, they, uh, they knocked out uh, a protein called Von Hippold Lindau factor, BHL. And that's a, that's a protein that's, that's required for a degradation of something called a hypoxia inducible factor, which is uh, something that enhances uh, uh, glycolysis, it enhances uh, transcription, that uh, uh, promotes transcription of, of genes that are involved in glycolysis using glucose. And so when they knock out BHL, uh, the pigment, of, in, in, specifically in the pigment epithelium, uh, the RP cells became uh, more glycolytic, okay? So you're not doing anything really damage the RP, you're just making it uh, consume more glucose. But as a consequence of that, uh, the photoreceptors also uh, suffered. So the, it, it resulted in photorece photoreceptor loss. There's fewer uh, outer nuclear layer uh, nuclei from the, for, the, for the photoreceptors. And, and this is just showing the ERG response but also, again, uh, <clears throat> indicating the photoreceptors aren't functioning properly. So um, two, you know, the two examples where uh, you, you alter the metabolism in a pigment epithelium, but the photoreceptors were the ones that, uh, were, that, that suffered. And just uh, as a review, because probably I don't think about this all the time, just want to remind you a little bit about uh, energy metabolism. Um, so, uh, so of course, glucose gets into cell, a typical cell through a, a glucose transporter, it goes through uh, the, the, the steps of glycolysis. One of those is glyceraldehyde three phosphate dehydrogenase that uses NAD. Uh, and uh, transfers, electrons, it transfers electrons from the substrate to NAD, make NADH. And also, uh, uh, it produces a couple of ATPs uh, in, in, uh, in glycolysis. <clears throat> and then uh, the final product of glycolysis is, is pyruvate. Remember this from uh, biochemistry classes? So the uh, pi final product is, is pyruvate, and pyruvate can uh, be reduced to lactate by the NADH. That's one path that it can go through. The other path it can, it can go through is, is uh, uh, it can enter through a, a, a pyruvate carrier protein to get into the uh, uh, to get into the uh, uh, mitochondria, and then uh, it can it can go through this uh, thing that you learned all about called the, the citric acid cycle, and in the process, all those carbons get oxidized. Um, if you after you go around a couple of times, all the carbons from pyruvate pyruvates three carbons uh, get oxidized to CO2, and uh, eventually, it, what, what that does. It transfers electrons to NADH, and those NAD, that NADH is used to pump protons. Remember, you get a proton gradient, and the proton gradient drives the synthesis of ATP. And, and the electrons from the NADH, electrons from these molecules that are originally on pyruvate, that are gone from the CO2, those got transferred to oxygen to make water. Okay, so that's your review of, of glycolysis uh, and, and uh, respiration. And so the uh, interesting thing about photoreceptors has been known for a long time is that photoreceptors are extremely glycolytic. There's, uh, back in the 1920s, uh, there, there, there were a couple of investigators, Otto Warburg and Hans Krebs, who were studying this, and they, they found two tissues that were extremely glycolytic. They actually took most of the carbons from glucose and converted it to lactate. One, one was tumors, and the other was, uh, was retina. Um, 
And so the, uh, and it's in the retina, it's the photoreceptors that do uh, all this glycolysis. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. So let's keep going through these examples then. Um, so uh, Doug Dean and Hank Kaplan at the uh, uh, University of Louisville um, uh, made a mouse, um, uh, or it took, uh, took uh, look at, looked at the, a mouse that had a mutation in rhodopsin that caused the, photo, the rod photoreceptors to degenerate, the Pro-23 his mouse, maybe some of you uh, know about that. Um, and what they did was, they, then they, uh, they injected a fluorescent molecule of glucose into the, uh, in, into, the, into the mouse. And so that fluorescent glucose can get taken up into cells through that glucose transporter, and it can get phosphorylated. And when glucose gets taken up into cell, it gets phosphorylated, it's trapped inside the cell. And if the glucose is fluorescent, then you can see the, the cells become more and more fluorescent. Okay, so normally when they, uh, when they did this in a wild type mouse, what they saw is that you may be a little bit of, uh, so the glucose was coming uh, from the core right here through the pigment epithelium uh, to the retina. Okay, so glucose would be going, flowing this way. And it makes pretty well through the pigment epithelium and it gets uh, taken up and trapped in, in the inner segments of the, of the photoreceptors, like I say, that's what you normally uh, find. But when the uh, photoreceptors die, um, then it turned out that the glucose didn't just pass through the archaea and get into the retina, it got actually trapped in the, in the pigment epithelium. Okay? So that's another uh, piece of evidence that there's this, some kind of metabolic interaction between uh, the, the photoreceptors and the pigment epithelium, because if the photoreceptors aren't there, the pigment epithelium just takes up in, in the, the glucose and, and traps it in the, in the pigment epithelium itself. And then uh, another observation, and this one was from uh, Claudia Punzo, who was a postdoc in, in Connie Septo's lab, was that in a, a mouse, this is a uh, phosphodesterase uh, uh, mutation, the, RD, the RD1 mouse, um, but they, uh, they were monitoring phosphorylation of the mTOR protein. And mTOR gets phosphorylated when nutrients are available. And so what they're, what they're showing here is that the, uh, um, uh, when the, uh, the red is the phosphorylated mTOR, indicating that the, uh, uh, the, the, that the nutrients are available, that the cones were getting uh, glucose. But in the RD1 mouse, where the rods degenerated, but the cones were still there, uh, the, there's no longer a strong red signal. So the cones, uh, even though they're genetically normal and healthy, they're not getting, uh, they're not getting nutrients. Uh, and it's probably because there aren't, the, the rods aren't there. Okay. So the, all these are evidence of interactions between these uh, cell types and the retina and the pigment of the Last example I want to give you is, um, is uh, this is an experiment done by uh, Steve Sang. And uh, uh, here, is, the red is labeling rhodopsin. Uh, the red here is labeling the, uh, the rod-specific phosphodesterase. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is another uh, phosphodesterase mutation. It's not the RD1 mutation, it's another, uh, another uh, similar one that degenerates a little bit more slowly. <clears throat> but so you can see in these, uh, in these retinas, uh, all, the, all the rod photoreceptors are degenerating. But then he worked out a way to, uh, to rescue some of, the, some of the rod cells. And so it, was a, uh, it, it used a, uh, um, a, a Cree uh, to activate a, a Cree enzyme that activates uh, a gene encoding the phosphodesterase. Uh, and so, um, and, it, and that Cree is regulated by the amount of tamoxifen that you inject into the animal. So the more tamoxifen that you inject into the animal, the more photoreceptor cells uh, activate uh, th that Cree and activate that phosphodesterase gene. So you can, you can rescue uh, either no photoreceptors, a few photoreceptors, or a lot of photoreceptors. And so that's what you see here. So, uh, so this is 30% uh, of the rods are rescued, 50% of the rods are rescued, 70% of the rods are rescued. And uh, what they saw was not only were there 30, 50, and 70% of, of the rods rescued, but the, what, the more rods are rescued, the healthier and bigger the rods looked, okay? So, uh, so the more rods that are there, the more support they're getting, it seems the more nutrients they're getting. That's another sort of puzzling uh, uh, observation that indicates that there's uh, these metabolic interactions. So, so I'm not gonna go through now about how we uh, uh, came up with this idea for this uh, metabolic ecosystem in the retina, and I'll go into that in more detail if you can make it to the, uh, uh, to the seminar later today, uh, but but basically the, what we what we're proposing, and we you know we th think there's pretty good evidence for this, and I don't think it's by all mean by any means uh, uh, proven yet. But the, our working model is that uh, glucose gets uh, comes from the blood, and it go, has to go through the pigment epithelium, 
Uh, there's tons of glucose transporters on both sides of the pigment epithelium. The glucose gets through, it gets, uh, uh, goes to the uh, retina, gets taken up by the photoreceptors. As uh, Warburg and Krebs discovered many years ago, the photoreceptors are very, very glycolytic. They convert the glucose to lactic acid. But so now look, if the uh, glucose is going through the RPE, what's the RPE going to do for nutrients if it's not using any of the glucose? Okay? So what it can do is it can use the lactate, lactic acid that's produced by the photoreceptors as fuel. But to do that, it needs its mitochondria. So that's why the mitochondria are so important uh, for, uh, for this metabolic ecosystem. Mitochondria and the RPE are so important for the metabolic ecosystem. And there's also these, uh, another interaction with the newer cells. I'll talk more about that later in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the talk later, uh, in the seminar later today. So from that perspective then, uh, these, uh, you know, these kind of make sense if you think about it from that perspective. So when the mitochondria and the RPE cells are disabled, uh, the RPE doesn't have any way to extract energy from the lactate. And so instead it uses all the glucose uh, before, uh, it, before the glucose can get to the, uh, uh, the it, the, before the glucose needed to get to the photoreceptors. And so the photoreceptors would starve. Okay, and if, if glycolysis is enhanced in the, art, in the pigment epithelium cells, then the pigment epithelium cells are gonna use the glucose before the glucose can actually get to, uh, get to the retina. If the rods degenerate because of mutation, uh, then the rods aren't here to make lactate, and so uh, the, uh, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no fuel for the uh, RPE, so the RPE in desperation is gonna use the, uh, is gonna use the glucose for itself. Uh, if the rods degenerate again, uh, uh, the, uh, the RPE is going to use the glucose for itself and the cones, which were genetically normal, uh, will start because the glucose is being stuck. It's, it's stuck up here in the, in the pigment epithelium. So, and, and then finally, if you have fewer rod photoreceptors here, there's fewer rods making lactic acid. So the pigment epithelium, cell, the pigment epithelium cells need energy. They don't have they don't have lactic acid, so they're going to uh, they're going to use all the glucose to, uh, for them for themselves. Uh, for my generation, that you might say that they they're going to bogart the glucose. <laughs> okay, so um, okay, so the so that's our hypothesis. Then is that the uh, pigment epithelium does best when it minimizes glycolysis and when its mitochondria are most active, right? You don't want it to use the glucose. Um, the, uh, uh, and you want this mitochondria to be very healthy so they can, uh, they can uh, use the lactic acid and not use glucose. And rods do best when they maximize glycolysis so they can make uh, as much lactate as they, uh, as they can. And so, uh, so there's a couple uh, applications of, of this, you know, a couple ways of thinking about this in, in relation to, uh, to disease. One is uh, what happens in aging. And uh, it turns out that uh, there have been several studies done. This is, I think, one of the best. Uh, it was a morphological study back in uh, 2006 of, of, uh, of RPE cells, looking at the mitochondria in RPE cells uh, from young donors and, and uh, age donors, uh, old age donors. And, and then uh, if you look carefully, you can see that the mitochondria here are fairly uh, robust and healthy looking, whereas here uh, they're looking sort of ratty. They're, they, they're you know, something... Something is wrong with them. It's not really clear what, but they, they uh, morphologically they don't look normal, and um, uh, and they, they actually did the study very quantitatively. So these are um, uh, these are from uh, uh, the uh, uh, donors uh, without and uh, donors uh, that are affected by AMD uh, macular degeneration, and uh, this is, is a function of age and. You can see even in the normal uh, donors, they, they, there's a decline in number of mitochondria, uh, the number of cristate per mitochondria, uh, the overall area of the mitochondria declines with age, but it declined faster in the in the uh, uh, in the AMD uh, in, the, in the donors that have AMD. So there's something uh, you know, mitochondria and the RPE are deteriorating, and by our model, that's a bad thing, right? Because uh, mitochondria have to be functional in order to allow the, uh, the RPE cells to not use glucose. And then uh, Deb Farrington has done some nice studies where they looked at, uh, uh, they used a method to, uh, to estimate the number of mutations in mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondria have their own, have their own genome. And so it's possible to, uh, to estimate how, how many mutations have accumulated in the mitochondrial genome. And uh, she saw a, a correlation between the severity of uh, macular degeneration in the donors that she, she looked at, 
and uh, and the uh, and the number of mutations in the mitochondria, and not so much not so much of a correlation in the uh, mitochondria and the retina. It, seem, it seems to seem to be something specifically happening in the RPE cells. And again, this by our model, this would be a bad thing, right? Because the pigment epithelium cells, if they don't have functional mitochondria, then they're getting this gl glucose for themselves, and their glucose won't reach the retina. And oh, there's a the data line isn't showing here, but this is a. Uh, and this is one of our studies. I, I'm not really showing much of our data uh, in, in this uh, talk this morning, but I'll show you a lot of it in the seminar this afternoon. But this is a sort of excerpt from it. Um, uh, what we found was that the, uh, um, and, and young mice versus old mice, uh, if you look at the, the amount of lactate produced by uh, ICUPS, which is uh, muscle, meta muscle metabolism from ICUPS is coming up from the pigment epithelium in the way, in the way we do the experiments, uh, they generate a lot more lactate uh, from the same amount of glucose compared to the young animals. Okay, so this is consistent with their, uh, their mitochondria failing, so the RPE cells depend more on glycolysis and, and more cons and consume more glucose. And I'll show you other data uh, uh, later today also if you come to that uh, talk. So our, our theory then, our hypothesis is that uh, as, the, as, as we age, our RPE cells uh, become more glycolytic because the mitochondria start to fail, and when the mitochondria, uh, and when, when they become more gly glycolytic, they use up the glucose before it has a chance to reach the retina, and then the retina starts. And that's why uh, that's why the photoreceptor, that's why we our vision deteriorates as we age. So another um, another way that this might relate to disease is, um, uh, uh, it, or uh, might be relevant to treatments for disease, is uh, is is uh, because of the diversity of uh, types of mutations that can cause uh, photoreceptor degeneration. So. Um, Actually, I've watched one of these videos before. I think John Flannery was here and showed, showed the same uh, same slide. But this is from uh, Steve Baker's uh, uh, compilation of, uh, of data showing that there's uh, uh, showing that, uh, that that there's uh, something like 300 different genes, I guess, that have been uh, identified that uh, have mutations that can when, when they have mutations, they cause photoreceptors to degenerate. And then if you look at the uh, types of genes. They're very diverse. Uh, anything from uh, phototransduction and visual cycle uh, to um, uh, outer segment structure, uh, cell cell interaction. So, the, so the the, uh, um, uh, the types of mutations that lead to photoreceptor degeneration are very diverse. So, if there was a way to just generally make the photoreceptors more robust, that might be a way to uh, slow down the degeneration in each of the. It, it maybe not all of them. But it might be a way to make them more robust and more resistant to the effects of these uh, of these diverse mutations. And so again, as I said, if you make the uh, uh, the rods do best when they maximize glycolysis. And so I just want to uh, finish up um, with a uh, <clears throat> experiment that Steve Sang did. Uh, we collaborated with him on, on this, and the idea was uh, uh, so Steve was sort of. Uh, um, he, he is more on the uh, genetic sides, uh, uh, genetics side of this, and he uh, uh, is very efficient at making uh, uh, mouse, mouse models. And so I've you know, been talking with him a lot over the years, and he uh, got interested in this idea of the metabolic ecosystem. And so he asked, uh, can we make the photoreceptors uh, more robust to stress by enhancing their ability to do uh, glycolysis, right? You don't want the RPE to do glycolysis, but you want the photoreceptors to do glycolysis so they can make lactate to, to support the RPE. So uh, Steve came up with, with a, one way to do this, uh, which was an activator a gene called CERT6, CERT2 and 6. Uh, it turns out that when, um, uh, when you inactivate CERT6 in a cell, it increases this hydroxy-inducible factor, which is a transcription factor that, uh, is that, that can enhance the transcription of genes uh, that support, uh, uh, that make proteins that support glycolysis. So uh, increases uh, HIF activity, increased glycolysis, and so can, if you do that, can you slow the photoreceptor degeneration caused by a PD6 mutation, it's supposed to be a mutation. And so what he did was um, he used a, uh, a, a, photo, a rod sp photoreceptor specific promoter uh, to express um, a Cree that can be activated by tamoxifen again. And then if that's there, it will, uh, it will, and it, it will delete the CERT6 gene because it's blocked by these two sites that the Cree can uh, get, can use to excise this part of this, uh, this DNA. And so when he did that, uh, he found that the, uh, uh, in the search, in the, uh, search six minus mutants, uh, the, in the, uh, in the retinas, there was no search six 
uh, whereas in the HIF-1 alpha, uh, which we were hoping would be upregulated, does seem to be upregulated, and there seem to be more, uh, more glucose transporters and other enzymes that are involved in glycolysis. So it seemed like it worked. Um, if you knock out CERT-6, you make the retinas more uh, glycolytic. And uh, so our, we got involved in this project because we can uh, measure metabolic flux. So we measured flux through glycolysis and flux through the TCA cycle. And uh, flux through glycolysis was enhanced uh, substantially. And flux through the TCA cycle was also enhanced, I think it's because we're making more pyruvate that can feed into the, uh, feed into the mitochondria. So, uh, so the more pyruvate uh, to uh, fuel the mitochondria, you get more TCA cycle activity. And what uh, Steve found was so these are the uh, these are the normal ones. It's not, I mean, normal, I mean that they have a PD6 mutation that causes them to uh, to slowly degenerate. So you can see there's there's fewer than normal uh, fewer than normal photoreceptors. Um, you don't have uh, so there's there's few photoreceptors because the photoreceptors have degenerated because of this PD6 mutation. But when he uh, knocked out CERT6 and enhanced glycolysis, it slowed the rate of degeneration. You can see there's a lot more photoreceptors here. So if you look at the outer nuclear layer density is an indicator of number of photoreceptors, it declines more slowly when it, um, glycolysis is enhanced. So it does seem, it doesn't you know, stop the degeneration altogether, uh, but it does seem to make them more able to resist it. <clears throat> so I get a different interpretation of that. It seems that <clears throat> it allows things to survive for about three weeks. And then if you look at the rate of decline, it actually declines more rapidly and comes to the same position at eight weeks. But it looks to me like it's allowing it to survive at a more normal level for about three weeks, and then the decline actually is faster. Look at the um, rate of those slopes. That's a that's actually a steeper slope. Yeah. Um, yeah, it could be. I, I, I think the uh, uh, you know it's still delaying the degeneration. Let's, let's put that. Yeah, way. delaying, yeah. delaying. But then when it when it yeah. goes, it goes. Uh, yeah, I agree. It goes. Yeah. It goes even faster. Yeah, it could be. It, it could be a. Uh, sort of cooperative effect too, like just like I was showing you before, and another experiment from Steve's lab, where he uh, reduced the number of photoreceptors, and when you reduce the number of photoreceptors, uh, that uh, that uh, has a, a, a negative effect on remaining photoreceptors because there's less lactate being produced. So it's positive, like a, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, but I'm just, when, no, 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 I'm saying it's, it could be, I just interpret saying, that data a little differently. I, I noticed it before, but what you're saying is probably right, because it could be like a cooperative effect. Once, once they start to go, sure. they bring all the others uh, down with them. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's the uh, so that's the idea. So um, um, so it's it's possible uh, that this could lead to uh, some types of therapy. This idea of a metabolic e ecosystem could lead to some types of therapy that may not cure the diseases, but they may may delay the uh, degeneration. And so, um, so another uh, uh, investigator, John Ash, uh, has, has been interested for a long time in the um, uh, uh, AMP kinase, and uh, and and um, it, uh, and the and, and metformin uh, treatment. And uh, and what John had found was uh, in another study that I don't have here, he found that when um, when they treated animals with metformin, uh, like uh, animals where the rods were degenerating. Uh, the metformin seemed to uh, delay the degeneration. What metformin is doing is, even though it's been around a long time, people really still, still as far as I know, they still don't really understand uh, its mechanism. But one thing that it, it's something pretty good agreement on, I think, is it inhibits complex one. Somehow that affects uh, energy metabolism. It enhances glycolysis. Uh, it enhances glycolysis and it actually uh, upregulates uh, mitochondrial uh, enzymes as well. And so, uh, so John found this with, his, with some of the mice he was investigating. He published that uh, a year or two ago. And then a, a student in his lab looked uh, at uh, patients. Uh, she went through, through a, a, a database of uh, uh, patients in, in Florida uh, and found, found patients that had been treated with uh, metformin or, or uh, not treated with metformin and either didn't, weren't diagnosed with AMD or were diagnosed with AMD, not describing it well. But, I think you get the idea. Uh, and what she, uh, uh, what she found was that uh, the, it was uh, the fewer uh, patients with AMD who had been uh, were treated with, uh, um, 
they, they were treated with metformin. So um, uh, there were fewer patients with AMD when they were treated with metformin. And so the, so the idea, uh, so the, there's some statistical data, I described that really poorly, but they have some uh, statistical data in, that, in this paper uh, suggesting that metformin can uh, delay or, reduce, or decrease the probability of, of, uh, of AMD. So, um, so that, that's uh, pretty much it. Like I said, I'll, I'll be describing more details of the stuff that we've done uh, uh, later in the seminar, and I'll, uh, later in the seminar I'll give this afternoon, and I'll take questions. Thank you. So, uh, fascinating lecture and a, and a nice, you know, general coverage of a very broad area which keeps expanding all the time. That metformin one's been out now for quite a while. And uh, uh, because this was just a correlation, there was a, there was a statistically significant correlation with taking metformin and having less of an odds of macular generation, but correlations never show causality and there are many other reasons. And one of the most intriguing that has never been disproved is is you take metformin generally in the population almost all the time because you have diabetes. Might the process of diabetes be protective for macular degeneration? And that would explain the correlation and have nothing to do with the actual metformin effect. So yeah. I think until they do a prospective randomized trial of metformin, which they haven't done yet, it hasn't been done. in patients with macular degeneration, this one is still out there as interesting and intriguing, but... From the but, data set that they had, they, they tried to... I just read the paper actually on the plane on the way here, but uh, from the data set... And, and this paper just came out, but uh, from the data set that they had, they did try to extract uh, diabetics uh, and non-diabetics and, 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 uh, and, and try to address that. So, wow. Um, and people, for, there were 10% on metformin who were not diabetics. I just, I yeah, find that hard to I'll, 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 I'll send, or I'll, I'll, we, later I can. I can yeah, we're, we're going to chat a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> so, so the ratio between rods and cones would seem important in your model. Yeah. yeah. So uh, would, you, would you hypothesize or could you comment on rates or incidence of retinal degeneration in more cone-dominated hmm. organisms uh, uh, versus... Yeah, I don't would, really know... cone-dominated yeah. organisms yeah. be more resistant? Um, or or is, that, is there a different metabolic mechanism at play? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we're, we're, um, so we, we're doing these same kinds of experiments in, um, in zebrafish retinas. Mm -hmm. So mouse retina is about 3% cones, and the zebrafish retina is about 50% uh, uh, cones. And actually, just recently, we've got a, a zebrafish um, where the cones are alive and all the rods have degenerated, so we can, we can do 100% cones. So we can do all these uh, same kinds of experiments to, to, to measure um, uh, how much glycolysis there is versus the mitochondrial activity in those. And I think that's the way uh, to start to answer that question, but I, uh, right now I, I, I can't really can't really answer. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I, got, I had one more. You, you, uh, intriguing about even in the non macular degeneration, the loss of mitochondrial function overall with age. Clinically, uh, my experience, my other colleagues they disagree. In the absence of a, a macular disease or glaucoma. Uh, I'm amazed at how well high contrast visual acuity is maintained well into the hundreds. In the absence of that, you know, the patients I have still are 20, 20, and they, but, but I do think when you talk to them, that they talk about other things, that, that, that it's clear that there's some contrast differences, night, you know, night driving, other types of differences. So we need to study that better. But as far as just our normal looking at visual acuity, in the absence of disease, my experience is with age, there's very, very little difference. Anybody disagree with me on that, Nick? Aren't you seeing if there's no MAC, nor MAC, these patients are still 20, 20, well in their 90s and hundreds? And... Yeah, so at, um, so my guess is that what would be happening is that the RPE is, is taking more glucose for itself and not giving the glucose to the photoreceptors. So it's not, killing the photo, it's not necessarily killing the photoreceptors. So the, the density of photoreceptors might stay the same, which would be, as far as I know, 
a major factor in acuity, right? Right, high so, contrast acuity. Yeah, so, so you might not lose acuity, but you, you might lose some other, you know, ability to dark and adapt. that I believe. Dark adapt or something like that. Contrast right? sensitivity. Contrast sensitivity, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Low, low, low light level the ability to see stuff like that. Yeah, okay. we need to study that more. That's an interesting thought. Yeah, and and, and uh, another thing we've been working on is trying to to uh, understand. Uh, so the, I don't know if you remember, but I showed you some data that Farrington had uh, indicating that mitochondria and RP are accumulating mutations. And we've been working with somebody at University of Washington who actually, actually has a way to uh, identify the specific mutations that are that are happening. And it seems like it's not the mutations that are accumulating are not accumulating from oxidative damage like people originally were, were thinking, but they're probably just due to uh, replication errors, errors from the, uh, the polymerase, from the mitochondrial polymerase. And those, that seems to be what's, what's accumulating, accumulating with age. And another way of looking at it too is how can they possibly last that long? And uh, so, uh, especially with a, a polymerase that, that, uh, that it, it, that's, not, that's somewhat error prone or can't really correct itself uh, very well. And so there may, so we're, you know, speculating uh, that uh, these RPE cells and, and maybe the photoreceptors also, maybe other cells in the body, body have some some way to sort of proofread their mitochondrial genome and get rid of the bad uh, genomes. But that's uh, uh, for uh, a few years from now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh,